In this class, we're going to look at how the nation of Israel and the people has been changed and is changing toward what we would, ex in a direction that we would expect God would uh, be directing things. And of course, we would, if we only just thought about it for a moment, that the, the Jewish people have, in a way, been back in the land for 70 years, which is the lifespan of a, of a person, that the people there now have been born in the land, many of them, and, and grown up in a different environment. And so we're going to look at how that environment and how uh, the events that have happened is shaping that nation and that an unseen hand is preparing that nation for greater things. <clears throat> this is the Dead Sea uh, from, from outer space. <laughs> and down by the Dead Sea, there's this place called Masada which we already referred to, it's where we saw the bones, uh, the picture of the bones, where they found the bones of the rebels who made the last stand at Masada against the Romans. It's an incredible fortress that Herod made, and uh, uh, that's a picture that I took from it uh, down by the Dead Sea, looking up. I mean, to, to have a fortified fortress on the top of that rock um, with water cisterns and to be able to self-sustain for years. Um, an amazing place that, that Herod made. He was such a great um, builder. <clears throat> and, uh, but the Romans came, it was the last stand, and, and they built these ramps, this ramp up. Um, if you look at the top uh, right-hand side of the screen up there, you can see where one of the Roman camps used to be. And when you stand on Masada and look down, you can see where the Romans encamped, these rectangles um, that are still there. Um, yeah, there's another one there in the middle. So the Romans built this ramp, and just systematically over days and days and months, they, they built a ramp up in the shortest area um, so that they could come. And if you know the story of Masada, the, the rebels knew that the Romans would be in the next day, they knew they would be slaughtered or taken as captives. And they, they actually had a lottery. Uh, and the last, the name that was drawn killed the, the rest of them and then killed themselves. And, uh, and they found these shards with the names on. They think this is probably what they actually used to, to put the names in a hat, so to speak, and to draw out who would, who would kill um, everyone else and then kill themselves. That was the end of the Jewish nation. And we talked about the place where they found the bones. <clears throat> this guy here in the middle in the toque, is that what you call in America, toque? We call it a toque in Canada, the woolly hat. His name is uh, Yigal Yadin. He's the archaeologist that, uh, that did the excavation work at Masada. And uh, what they found there is uh, Herod wasn't religious, but when the, the rebels, the Jewish rebels had taken it, they had made a synagogue. And um, this is the synagogue there. Um, as well, you can see on the right-hand side, there's like a little room um, over there. This is the door to the room. Uh, in, in that area where that uh, door is, and actually, if you could see in there, uh, when I was there, um, there was a scribe working in there. And I'll tell you what that was for in a moment. So, uh, but this is where the Geniza was. And the Geniza is where the Jews buried um, worn-out scrolls, worn-out Bibles. So you can't take the Word of God and throw it in the garbage, right, even if it's a very worn-out copy. So we bury it under the floor of the synagogue. And so they had this place. And uh, when Yigal Yadin, obviously he knows the Jewish people and their customs, so they found the synagogue. So let's start looking to see if we can find a Geniza, because if there's a Geniza, then there's going to be maybe some scrolls and, that were worn out that were put there. <clears throat> now this is absolutely incredible because they, they dig up the Geniza and they find scrolls and they find Ezekiel's prophecy of the dry bones. I mean, um, you'd almost say God has a sense of humor, right? <laughs> that in Masada, in the synagogue, the scroll that we're going to find is the prophecy of the dry bones from Ezekiel 37. Um, and it's, and he then says, you know, he looks at it, he says it's the same as the Masoretic text, it's the same as our Bible, and, and so forth. But the significance is amazing, but <clears throat> they didn't just find one scroll, they found another one there as well, from Deuteronomy, and these are the passages along the top there, Deuteronomy 32, verses 46 to 47, 33, and so forth. Uh, the large fragment over there on the, on the right contains parts of Deuteronomy 33, verses 17 to 21. 
Um, and they found this as well. So what else do they find? The blessings of the tribes. So they find uh, the prophecy of the dry bones and Moses' blessings of the tribes for the, for the future of, of the nation of Israel, the kingdom of God. That's what they find in the, in the Geniza at, at Masada. <clears throat> and so what we find is that, I mean, we already talked about how the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Isaiah Scroll, was bought on the very day the UN voted for, for Israel. And then these scrolls are found in Masada. And, and it constantly, I, th I believe that God is drawing the attention of the nation to say, this is my word. And, 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 and drawing their attention to it. And of course, the land of Israel does. I mean, if you're going to go to the land of Israel, you can't really get away from the Bible. Because everywhere you, you're going to go, you're, now we're, we're driving through the Valley of Elah. Now we're driving past, through the Ailon Valley, and we're on the way up to Jerusalem. And now this is Jerusalem, and then this has happened, this and happened. Right? Everywhere you go, every, every place is going to be some significance from the Bible. <clears throat> so the land brings you to the Bible. And not only does the land bring you to the Bible, but now we discover the Word of God in the land. We dig in the, in the land and we... We find the word of God, and then the language itself, and, and you know, we, we probably don't think about this, but the language brings you to the Hebrew scriptures, right? So if you're going to get into the Hebrew language, eventually you're going to end up at the Hebrew Bible, because that's where the language is born. That's the, the principal text of the language, right? People talk about English, and they say, you know, if you really get into English, you're going to end up at the King James Bible, and, you know, maybe Shakespeare or whatever, right? But the Bible's a part of our language, in the phrases we use, and, and in our culture, maybe less as time goes on. But so it's the same in, in the Hebrew language. So um, this is a book called Hebrew Reborn, by a man called Shalom Spiegel. And <clears throat> he's writing about Eliezer ben Yehuda, who was considered a heretic by the religious Jews. So he says, just as they, the religious Jews at the time, just as they could hardly have surmised that this heretic, Eliezer ben Yehuda, through his unwearying service to the Hebrew word, unconsciously aroused the religious forces latent within it. For there is no such thing as a creedless Hebrew. He who conjures up Hebrew at the same time involuntarily opens sluices for the obstructed springs of an ancient religious civilization. Though he may not welcome them, neither can he rid himself of the spirits he has called up. In other words, he's saying Eliezer Yehuda was a heretic to the religious Jews, but really by what he did with the language, he brought the things of the Bible, of the Hebrew scriptures, to people's attention. Um, and so the land brings us to the Bible in the events that happen there and in, and in the Word of God that's been discovered there. And the language itself brings us to the Bible. And then, of course, there's archaeology. So this is just south of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It's the City of David excavations where they're digging um, <clears throat> in what was the City of David. And, of course, you're going to find things. I mean, they have this problem in Israel, uh, and probably especially around Jerusalem. Anybody who's, you know, you get your building permit, you're going to build a house, start digging. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys, you've got to stop. Um, your land is an archaeological site. So now, you know, we've got to do some archaeology before you can continue your building project. This is what happens all the time. Okay, so there's wherever you dig, you're going to find things. And often, those things are going to bring you to the Bible. And of course, if you're going to dig near the Temple Mount, or just south of the Temple Mount in the city of David, you're going to, you're going to find very interesting things, which have been found there. Um, and this is on, just on the other side of that, uh, a piece of wall there. That, uh, I don't know if you can make it out, so I, look, I highlighted it there. There's one piece of wall that's sticking out. This is the wall that was built by Nehemiah. So you can go there, right, and see the wall that was built by Nehemiah. This is the wall that they, they made jokes about, and they said, even if a fox went up, he's going to make your wall fall down. And uh, so at least part of it's still standing um, over you know, 2,500 years later. So, but um, just in behind this wall, uh, there was a very interesting uh, spot. Um, so this is just in behind that wall. And there's a, a sign here that tells you what was discovered here, because they, there's this room where they found all these clay seals.
and, uh, and it has one of them on the sign there, which is, so these are all people from the Bible, right? Um, Jukal uh, ben Sh uh, Shalemayahu, which is Jukal, the son of Shalemiah, okay? We're not going to read all these verses because it'll take too much time, but here's a seal, Jeremiah 38, verse 1. Um, and it looks like I probably have a wrong passage there, unless it had the two names in the same verse, did it? It did? Good. That's good. So anyway, here's uh, Gedaliah's seal, Gedaliah ben Pashur, the son of Pashur, uh, and Jeremiah as well. And... Uh, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, Gemariah Yahu ben Shaphan, uh, Jeremiah 36, verse 10, uh, and there's his seal. And uh, this one's belonging to Hezekiah, uh, the king, uh, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. Hezekiah has two different seals they found, and they think that uh, this one's from later in his life, and the other one's from earlier, because this one has the, the sun in the middle, the sun arising with wings on it. And uh, they think that uh, maybe this is after uh, Hezekiah had been healed of his sickness. So he had a, a, a seal with the sun on it arising with the wings. So that, that's interesting. But anyway, that is the seal of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And of course, Hezekiah is the one that um, also built the water tunnel. So you can go and see his seal. And then you can walk through the tunnel that he made to bring water into Jerusalem. Uh, and then recently they just found this. And they, they think, they say it's not 100% because there's a little bit damaged on the side of the seal. But this is, uh, they think, could be, because it, it could say uh, the seal, of it's uh, Isaiah the prophet. But just the end uh, a letter is missing. So, you know, there may be a little bit of chance that it could be something else. But uh, I, I read what uh, Lane Rittmeyer said about it on his, he has a little blog. If you ever, uh, he always puts interesting things on. So he commented on this and he said, you know, it's, it's pretty much, in his opinion, it was the seal of Isaiah. So, um, so there, we've, the Hezekiah, Isaiah, all these people from, uh, from that time. And so at, when we look at the archaeology of the land, it's bringing us to the Bible and it's bringing us to the prophets. So it, the seal of Isaiah, oh, we discovered the Dead Sea Scroll of Isaiah. It's always bringing us to the message of Isaiah. And what's the message of Isaiah? I'm going to bring you back from the four corners of the world. And I'm going to bring you back to this land. So I think, you know, God is pointing these things out um, so that it would draw the attention of people in Israel, the Jewish people, that, look, we're here for a reason, but it's also has to be for us, isn't it? To, so that we would see the evidence of the, of the word of God. <clears throat> Recently, they... Um, they did uh, work around the Pool of Siloam. Uh, before, it was kind of like this little Byzantine pool at the end of, the, uh, of Hezekiah's tunnel. Uh, but now you can actually see the steps of the, of the Siloam pool uh, where Jesus would have gone and where the pool was, which would be down on this flat part. And then the steps here would be where people could sit by the pool. And uh, <clears throat> so the pool was down here at the bottom of Hezekiah's tunnel. And then there was a street that went up to the Temple Mount. Okay, so when you came to worship, you could wash in the pool, and then you could ascend up to the Temple Mount, up this main road. So people would go up that road um, after cleansing themselves in the, in the Pool of Siloam, would go up this road up to the Temple um, to worship. So they've discovered some of this road, and it's kind of underground, uh, but there, you can see the actual steps there. Of this of this road, <clears throat> underneath the road, there was a uh, a drainage tunnel, right? So uh, the water comes uh, down the road, and then in the middle it has this drain, right? So the water can drain down, uh, back down off the road. And so today, when you go there, you see the pool of Siloam and the and the bit of the road, and then you walk up the drainage tunnel back up to the visitor center. So um, that's actually my wife in the uh, in the drainage tunnel. Uh, so, in the drainage tunnel, they uh, found all this interesting stuff. The rebels uh, hid out there in AD 70, so they found like a dagger, right, from the rebels because they were hiding in this, in this drainage tunnel. Um, but uh, they also found other stuff because obviously, you know, people drop a coin, you drop something, and right, it rolls down the street and goes into the drain. This is what, what happened. So, great for archaeology. So, uh, what do they find? Well, they find this. This is the bell off the high priest's garment. So he goes from the pool of Siloam, right? And he's going up to the temple and the, and the bell shaped like a pomegranate. 
as, the, as this is, it falls off his garments and rolls down to the drain, and then we, we find it. So now you can go to the visit center and buy jewelry, right, shaped like the, the original high priest's uh, bell off this garment. So it's amazing. But the amazing thing about this is, is that bell has a significance. It was on the... Um, it was on the border of the high priest's garment, and as it says at the end of this verse, it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. So if you're in the camp of Israel, and you're sitting in your tent, and you hear the sound of the high priest, his sound went out through the camp, the sound of the high priest. And when he went in and out of the tabernacle, the, there was a sound, his sound would be heard. In Psalm 89, it talks about the covenant, um, the mercies of the Lord. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. And then it says, Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. And that's like the high priest's garment. Um, he walked, and when he walked, he made a joyful sound, and he walked in the light of the countenance. And that's how, how we're supposed to walk. So his sound went out. And that's related to the covenant um, in this psalm, to the, the sure mercies of David. The joyful sound of the gospel went out from Israel, into, into all the earth. And that's the destiny of Israel as we believe in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so in uh, Romans, the apostle says, uh, just at the end of that passage, he says, Yes, verily, their sound went out into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. And it was at the time of King Solomon. That was the purpose of the kingdom of God was that the nations and peoples around would come and would come to the temple and they would learn of the ways of God. And that's how it's going to be in the kingdom of God. And that's what this bell was. Um, so it brings our attention again to, to the Bible and what was the bell and the high priest and what did it mean. So the land of Israel brings us to the Bible and the discoveries do um, and to the kingdom of God. As, and that's uh, in Chronicles where it talks about the kingdom of God in the past. So we've talked about Zionism. It was a secular movement to begin with. But as the Jews have come back to the land, they are changing as a people. <clears throat> um, Theodore Herzl, um, we, we've already read the other quote, but this one, he says, shall we end by having a theocracy? Of course, we believe that we, it will end up being a the theocracy when the Lord Jesus Christ is king. But in his opinion, no, indeed. Faith unites us, knowledge gives us freedom, we shall therefore prevent any theocratic tendencies from coming to the fore on the part of our priesthood, uh, his rabbis. We shall keep our priests within the confines of their temples in the same way as we shall keep our professional army within the confines of their barracks. So to Theodore Herzl, we can have religion, but you know it stays in its proper place. Uh, so there's, there's an idea of what the state of Israel would be, right? So... What is the state of Israel to be? Theodore Herzl thought about that. Is it to be a theo theocracy? Is it to be religious? Um, we think of the state of Israel now that it's going to be really <clears throat> dismantled as what it is. And it's going to become a theocracy where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be king and reign over, over that nation. So that's a big question in Israel today is, well, we've come back to the land. What is this nation going to be? Um, and Theodore Herzl had his ideas, and many people in Israel have their ideas today, and, and there's a divide in Israel today. And people often say, uh, in Israel, they, they, they talk about um, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem uh, being, representing two different things. Tel Aviv, they say, is a city built on sand, and it's a, it's a secular city. You know, the people are kind of one way, and then Jerusalem is built on a rock, and it's a different city. So if we go to the land of Israel, depending on where we go, we can get different impressions about what it's like, right? So um, 
you know, it, it, what kind of a nation is it? Well, you know, it might depend on, definitely depend on where you go and who you talk to and, and what you see. So that's one idea of the State of Israel that Theodore Herzl had, and many people today in Israel have that idea. But there's uh, a different view, of course, that we've been, we've been talking about already, about how that um, <clears throat> the, the Jews came back as a fulfillment of prophecy. That this is God's hand. That this is a stage, another step on, onto the word, uh, the redemption. That's another idea. Um, that is not a fringe idea in Israel today. Um, actually, quite a, a large number of people feel that way. Um, so much so that there's a political party called the, the National, or Jewish Home, it's called now. It used to be called the National Religious Party, Jewish Home. Uh, and the, you might have heard of Naftali Bennett. Um, Naftali Bennett is a religious Zionist, and he would have this other view of, the, uh, of what the state of Israel would be. So this is a man called Moshe Faglin, and uh, he came to Toronto a few years ago now, and I went to hear him speak there and, uh, and, and was able to get a, a copy of his book. <clears throat> He's an Israeli politician and writer. Very uh, interesting man. Very interesting writing uh, that he's written on, on, on his idea of the Jewish state. So he wrote a book called The War of Dreams, From the State of the Jews to, the, to a Jewish State. Okay, so you catch that. Well, I'll show you the cover of the book in a moment. Okay, so there's two different dreams for, for the land of Israel, for the nation of Israel. So he writes, there is another war being fought in Israel. So there's a war within Israel today, he says. It is the war between the Jews, the war of dreams. The internal war is fought to determine the direction of the country. What will the national dream, or what will be the national dream of the nation of Israel? Will it be the dream of Herzl? The dream of being a nation like all other nations? Or will it be the dream of our forefathers to perfect the world in the kingdom of the Almighty? Until today, this, this is a few years ago now, probably about 10 years ago, but until today, the first dream has had the upper hand. We have built the state of the Jews as dictated by Herzl. In this state, we have done all that we could to assimilate the nation of Israel and turn it into a nation just like all other nations. Once we mistakenly even conquered the Temple Mount, he's talking about in the Six Day War, but we immediately lowered the Israeli flag from there so that nobody would start to think about the Temple, heaven forbid. So he's talking about how there's this, this war in Israeli society between two different ideas of what this nation is going to be. And here's the cover of his book. <clears throat> The war of the dreams, from the state of the Jews to a Jewish state. So what's going to be the character of the state? Is it a state like all the other nations where the Jews can live? Or is it a Jewish state that is founded on Jewish ideas and principles? And of course, what uh, Moshe Faglin would think of as a Jewish state would be different than what it actually is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. And then it'll be the true Jewish state as, as God would have designed it. But notice this picture. This is a very fascinating picture. This uh, picture is from uh, when um, they uh, destroyed the Jewish communities in Gaza. Okay, so um, in, uh, I'm trying to think when that was. It was the same year that there was the, uh, the thing in New Orleans with the hurricane. Okay, so that's, I don't remember. Hmm? Katrina. Katrina. It was the same year as Hurricane Katrina. Okay, Ariel Sharon was prime minister in Israel. And they, there was Jewish communities in the Gaza Strip. About 7,000 Jews lived in the Gaza Strip. And they forcibly removed the Jews out, destroyed the communities, and, and blocked off the Gaza Strip. Right? They didn't want it. They're like, okay, we're out of here. It's, and they moved out. They pulled out of, of the Gaza Strip. So this picture was taken when soldiers and police came to forcibly remove the Jewish people from their homes that didn't want to leave. And, uh, and so there was a very much this, this uh, war within Israeli society came forward at that time, right? Should, should we destroy Jewish communities and pull Jews out, or should, uh, or should we stay? Did we come back here as a fulfillment of prophecy, and therefore is it wrong for us to, to pull out, right? That's if you have this idea that God brought you to this land as a fulfillment of prophecy, how can I give this land to someone else? 
right? So the, there's a, uh, whereas the secular Jew thinks, this is crazy, we don't want to be in the Gaza Strip, let's pull out and just, you know, maybe this will make peace. So there's, those are the two ideas. So the soldiers come, this boy's shirt that he's wearing, um, the orange color became the symbol of those who uh, had the more religious viewpoint, okay? So this boy's wearing an orange shirt. On the back of his shirt, it has an acronym for Hashem, for the name of God, right? Uh, Yahweh would be what that uh, acronym, Hashem means the name, so God. He is the king. Okay, so there's the two ideas. So that was one of the sayings that was widely used at that time. Hashem hu hamelech, right? Yahweh, he is the king. Or, uh, uh, so in that picture, you have this struggle about the future of, of the Jewish state. So that's why it's on the cover um, of this book. The War of Dreams, the dream of Theodore Herzl, or a dream of a Jewish state. Okay? So obviously, we talked about uh, Rabbi Cook. So he was the first chief rabbi of Israel before the state was proclaimed. Okay, so he had this idea that we came back to this land as a, a step on the way to redemption. So here he is uh, teaching his students, and he says, the hope for the redemption is the force that sustains Judaism in the diaspora. So Jews outside the land, their hope is sustained um, <clears throat> uh, by the hope of redemption. He says, the Judaism, the Jewish religion, the Judaism of Eretz Israel, of the land of Israel, in the land of Israel, is the very redemption. So he's saying, what's happening here, this is the redemption. This is leading toward the redemption. So he had this other idea, and he began to teach that idea, and it began to take on. Now, typically, when you think of a religious Jew, and there's many religious Jews like this in, in Israel still today, right? The black coat, the black hat, right? Very conservative, right? So that's not, um, that's not so much what the religious Zionist Jew is going to look like. And I have an extreme picture for you, right? These were some young guys that were on a, uh, on a walk around the Temple Mount that happens once a month on the new moon. There's a walk around the Temple Mount, and you go to each one of the gates up to the Temple Mount, and, and you recite the Psalms of Ascent, the Songs of Degrees, one for each gate, and you go all the way around the Temple Mount back to the Western Wall, Kotel again. And these guys were on that walk. But, you know, almost like a bit of a, a hippie type of look, right? This is, uh, and so there's a lot of young people that really feel this way. So when you go uh, on this march, if you were to go on it, there's like tons of these young people Massive crowds of these young people all dancing, singing psalms around the Temple Mount. So there's a tremendous spirit um, within, these, within these young people and, and, and older people as well. So um, this is a, from a paper about religious Zionism. So uh, if we're going to distinguish what's religious Zionism compared to the usual you know, Judaism, the differentiation is this idea that the land of Israel and the return to the land is a step to redemption. And once you have that idea, it changes your outlook about everything to do with the, with the nation of Israel, if you're Jewish. Right? So the best officers in the army are national religious because they're willing to sacrifice themselves. They really believe in what they're doing. Right? So, and it affects how you live on the land, where you live on the land, how you live your life in the land of Israel. So, um, so this idea was growing um, before 1967, and that's what this paper is talking about. So it says, the energy stored up inside both educators and students was formidable before 1967. On the surface stood out initially their desire to enter into all aspects of Israeli society, thereby contributing to the national renaissance in contrast to the relatively marginal status of the religious Zionist community at the time in Israeli society. On an unseen level, however, their special approach to the question of the land of Israel awaited an opportunity for expression. And that's what happened in 1967, when all of a sudden um, the all the biblical heartland, and we'll see in a minute what that exactly means, was now you could go um, there. So I'll talk about that in a moment. So um, Joel 3 uh, says, 
in those days and at that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will bring all nations down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. So one of um, our brethren, a Christadelphian, uh, uh, Brother Bilton, in 1955, he, he wrote about this because at that point, um, Israel didn't have the old city of Jerusalem, and they didn't have all that area today. It was called the West Bank on the map there. So he wrote, he said, because Jerusalem, the old Jerusalem, old city of Jerusalem, must be possessed by the Jews prior to Christ's return so that he might manifest himself to them as their deliverer, deliverer and savior, the ejection of Hashemite Jordan from there is a foregone conclusion. We can look then for developments which will result in Israel's getting possession of the whole city. Twelve years later, Israel got possession of the whole city. And this map is, is when Israel didn't have it. There was like a no man's land, right? And the whole old city of Jerusalem was part of Jordan. So 1967 happens, and all that whole West Bank area, um, which is really, if you can see this, the purple part down here is, is the tribe of Judah. So everything from Jerusalem south is the tribe of Judah. So when you talk about Judah and Jerusalem, that's really what happened in 1967. Israel got possession of Judah and Jerusalem, and they got the northern West Bank as well, um, up to where it says Nabulus. That would be Shechem in, in, in Bible times. Now, what's fascinating is, and it really struck me uh, recently, in Zechariah it talks about this. Uh, we know the passage, it says, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling, unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and Jerusalem. Notice that when Gog comes, part of the uh, object, the center of his um, coming down into the land is, is against Judah and Jerusalem. And when you really think about that in terms of, um, of the West Bank, uh, that it is part of the West Bank. Now this is really fascinating because Really, the West Bank is the foremost issue today um, when it comes to the question of the land of Israel. It's what people mostly talk about because this is where they would want to create a Palestinian state in, in the West Bank. So it's become the most contentious part of the land of Israel, Jerusalem and Judea, and then the northern uh, part as well, which is the tribe of Benjamin and up into Ephraim. Now, what's... Why this is called the biblical heartland is because when um, Abraham comes into the land, right, he comes in from up from Syria somewhere, from Haran. So maybe he comes down, you know, by the Golan Heights or down the Hula Valley, comes in. And the first place he comes to is, is Shechem, where it says Nam on the map. So he comes to Shechem. That's the first place. And then he travels down that spine of mountains because that's all the mountainous part there. He travels down there, and, and, and he's going to go Shechem, and then uh, you're going to go through, you're going to pass today, you can drive on the same road, Route 60. It's kind of like the way of the forefathers, it says on the sign. Because you're going to go from uh, Shechem, past, you're going to go right past Shiloh, you're going to go past Bethel, you're going to come past Jerusalem, you're going to go past Bethlehem, past Rachel's tomb, and then you're going to go through Hebron, and you're going to keep going down until you come to Beersheba, just out of the bottom. It's Abraham's route, right? It's the way of the forefathers. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're going up and down this road, okay? So all those biblical places along that road are all so significant in the Bible. So in 1967, all of a sudden, the whole West Bank is there, and then there's all these uh, people who have this religious Zionist idea that's waiting for an opportunity for expression, so they're the ones that go and live in the West Bank. And that's, uh, that's, what, um, that's what has happened. Okay, we're going to uh, listen to a video clip now of a man who has a store in Jerusalem. So if you're ever in Jerusalem and you want to talk to somebody interesting, right? It's called the Sharashim Shop. You can go in there. The guy's name is Moshe Kapinski, and he knows Christadelphians, and he will talk to you, right? You can ask him your questions or whatever. Fascinating guy. So he's from Canada originally, uh, and he's going to tell a story of his story of the Six-Day War, right? So he's, he's going to go into his chemistry exam, and he sneaks into his chemistry exam a transistor radio so he can listen to the news as he's doing his uh, chemistry exam. So um, here we go. They were actually building mass graves, expecting 
the worst really? that happened. And remember, you're talking about not that many years from the Holocaust. And right. so many believed this was going to be another Holocaust. And where I was living in Canada, our community was, was, was torn. And, and uh, so that morning, during the chemistry exam, I decided whatever happened in the chemistry exam, I wanted to listen to what was going on. And so I brought one of those little, I brought one of those little transistor radios with the little bud that I hung through my sleeve and listened throughout the exam. And what occurred then was a live transmission or a, call or a recording of a live transmission of soldiers entering the old city of Jerusalem. And what you heard was a secular reporter, because he declared himself to be a secular reporter, uh, running with the soldiers. You heard the bullets firing. You heard his lack of being able to catch his breath as they walked by, drove, ran by this burning tank by Lion's Gate. And then all you heard were even as the shots were being fired, people yelling one to each other, where is it? Where is the wall? How do we get to the wall? And, uh, and he continued and he got to the wall and I remember him in a very trembling voice said, I'm not a religious man. I've never been a religious man, but here I am touching the stones of the wall that for 2,000 years my ancestors have wanted to be here and for some reason I've been gifted that opportunity and he broke into tears. At that point, Rabbi Gorin, who was probably one of the most charismatic and, and fascinating rabbis uh, in this country, and he was the chief rabbi of the army, he arrived. And he arrived with a little shofar that he had found, and then he blew the shofar. And I remember to this day, the second I heard that shofar through that little earbud, my world turned around. I have two options. One option was to stay in Canada, do well professionally and in business. And uh, that was one option. And the other option was to come to this land and to be a fulfillment of prophecy. So we can, you can hear him speaking. You can see how events and how what was happening in the land of Israel brought him to the land of Israel and to the Bible and the recognition of I can go to this land and be part of a fulfillment of prophecy. So he moved with his family to the land of Israel. Um, and this is the quote that he's referring to. Um, this is a man called Yossi Ronan. So the, uh, Israel took the old city in 1967. And, and he said, you know, these men are trying to find, they're secular Jews, but they're trying to find the Western Wall. And he says, I'm walking right now down the steps toward the Western Wall. I'm not a religious man. I've n I never have been, but this is the Western Wall, and I am touching the stones of the Western Wall. And you can hear the emotion in his voice. So it's, it, it's bringing people to, to realize there's something else here. There's a higher power um, in this. And then he, he talked about um, Rabbi Sh uh, Gorin, blowing the shofar. This, so he talks about how he heard it in the, in the earbud in his exam. So this is exactly, this is it. This is a recording of that exact moment. So he heard that in his chemistry exam. That's exactly what he listened to, that exact news report. He heard that, and then he said, I'm going to the land of Israel. And uh, absolutely amazing. And, uh, and it woke something inside him, right? That, that he realized this is the hand, the hand of God. <clears throat> So here's a map of, uh, of Israel, and it's, a, and it's a good one because it shows that area of the West Bank. So in Ezekiel, when it talks about the mountains of Israel, you can really see that this area is, is, is really part of the mountains of Israel. There's mountains up north as well and some other mountains, but in comparison to the coastal plain on the south uh, there, um, you can see how that the West Bank is the mountains of Israel. And on this map, they're, they're showing you how... Uh, it's only 15 kilometers from the mountains to the coast and how vulnerable Israel would be if there was a hostile terrorist state 
in that, in that area. And you can see uh, that that would be the case. But this is the biblical heartland. So all down through this, along the top of this spine of mountains is all those religious significant cities that Abraham um, visited. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the entrance now to Shiloh uh, today. And uh, it's the sign as you come into the city of Shiloh. And uh, on the sign it says, on the top it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, we will welcome him from the house of the Lord. And that's, of course, where the tabernacle was at the time of Shiloh. And you can, you can see exactly where the, the tabernacle stood because it's mountainous and there's this flat, flat rectangular area um, where, where the tabernacle was just above the road where the, where the mound of, of Shiloh is in the excavations. And right beside where the tabernacle was, there's the place they made olive oil. So this would be the place that they made olive oil, that Samuel kept the lamp, right? So here's where the olive oil is made for the temple, and Samuel's job is to get the oil and to keep the lamp burning. Uh, and you can go stand right there. This is standing right on the side of that tabernacle spot. And you're looking up the way of the forefathers. This is the road of Abraham. And there's another Jewish community on the hilltop up there. It's called Eli after Eli the priest. Uh, there's another view up that road. So look at this quote from, from Eureka, John Thomas. He says, It may be remarked here that there will have been a considerable gathering of Israelites upon the mountains of Israel before the invasion of the country by Gog and his capture of Jerusalem. And, and you're standing right there, and, it, and it's a, a fulfillment of that exactly, that there's a considerable gathering of Israelites on the mountains of Israel, um, Israel today. Another, just another John Thomas quote there. Um, we'll just go a few lines down. It says, so it will, he's talking about go coming, so it will as far as the mountainous parts of the land are concerned. So he, he saw in Ezekiel that it focuses on the mountainous parts of the land. And it's fascinating today that that part of the land is the most contentious, the most talked about, the most, uh, the most controversial. Brother Graham Pierce um, also wrote about this. It's from, this is from a 1981 Milestones, right? Uh, his son still does the Milestones today. The Milestones booklet comes out once a year. So this is from the 1981 Milestones. And he says, in the light of Ezekiel 38, verse 12, that the people dwell in the midst or naval margin of the land, one hardly expects Israel to give up her settlements in the West Bank. That's 1981. At that point, I'll show you in a minute how few settlements there were in the West Bank in 1981. Um, this is more today, um, and I'm not going to go into detail. But what's interesting with what we've been talking about is the blue communities that I've highlighted are, um, those are national religious, religious Zionist communities. So when you look at the West Bank and the people that live there, they have a different character than the rest of the nation of Israel. Um, and the red ones are ultra-Orthodox, more uh, strict religious communities. The green ones are mixed communities. The brown ones in the Jordan Valley and a few on the edge are secular. So you can see how religious that part of the land is because, um, as it said in that quote, those people were waiting for a time, an opportunity for expressing their religious Zionist beliefs, and that opportunity came in 1967, and they're the ones that built these communities. Now, this is the growth of those communities. So when Graham Pierce is writing in Milestones, it's 1981, it's not on the chart, um, but there was less than 21,700 in the West Bank at that time. To, this is 2015, um, and, and it's uh, growing rapidly. You can see every year it grows. It's now over 400,000, and that doesn't include East Jerusalem. So people now are rightly looking at the situation. People that have, have uh, put out this idea of having two states, and, and, they, and that, people are now saying, look, it's impossible. We cannot forcibly remove 400,000 people. It's just not going to happen uh, because these people don't want to move. These people are r living of them out of religious conviction. So to try and get that person to leave their house is very difficult um, as well. And because those people are ideological, uh, this is 
going back to 2012, but it's saying that the population in the West Bank, the population growth is almost three times as fast as the national rate. Because um, in Tel Aviv, right, we're secular. How many kids do we want to have? 1.6 or something, right? It's like, it's like America or Canada. We don't want a lot of kids. But if you're a religious Zionist and you're living in the, in the West Bank, how many kids do you want to have? 10, 12, 14, right? As many as possible because we're here to live in the land and to build this place. So they have a completely different viewpoint. So that's why these, uh, these communities are growing so fast. Of course, the world doesn't like this and they don't like the idea of, a, of a, a religious growth in the land of Israel. The Catholic Church doesn't like it, our media doesn't like it, our secular media doesn't like it, so it's very controversial. And these people never get a, uh, never get a good story in the media on these, on these people. You will never find that. Um, and again, John Thomas, I mean, this is just looking at the Word of God, uh, but he says the time of, of, of the return of Christ, it, it fast approaches, the nearer it arrives, the more important, and we could say the more controversial, do all questions become bearing upon Judah's land and Zion, the city of their king. If the people of Israel had, if the Jewish people had come back and everything had been normal and Theodore Herzl's vision had come to pass and it was a normal nation like all the other nations, that's not what the Bible says is going to happen. And that's not what has happened. Again, it's another miracle. It's another um, amazing thing to, to consider to say, look, there's something else going on here uh, and to draw our attention to. And John Thomas, you know, 1868, he's saying the closer we get to the return of Christ, these questions are going to be the most controversial questions. Judah's land and Zion, the city of their king. Look what happened. You know, Trump comes along and says, we're going to move our embassy to Jerusalem. And the uproar in the world because the United States is moving their embassy to the capital city of Israel, which, you know, it's, it's been their capital city since the state was uh, established, you know, and then they took East Jerusalem as well. But that's how controversial this is. I just want to, I'm not going to go into any examples of media bias today for the sake of time, but I would suggest that you uh, look at a, a website called honestreporting.com. It's honestreporting.com. It's entirely from a Jewish perspective of somebody who's defending uh, the Jewish people in the media. Okay? But if you, want to, uh, if you want to hear what they're saying, if you want to read the analysis of news articles for yourself, then I recommend that you, you, that you go and see that. It's very eye-opening and uh, very well done and very informative. Uh, to look at. But we as Christadelphians, we have uh, Revelation chapter 16, the words of Jesus Christ telling us about our time that there's going to be unclean spirits, unclean teachings that are going to go out into the world and are going to bring the nations to Armageddon. Okay, the result of, of what the political powers in this world are going to say is going to eventually bring the nations to the battle of Armageddon again against God's people and against God's work of bringing back the Jewish people to the land. That's what's going to happen. So would we expect that the media is going to be pro-Israel, pro-Jewish religious Zionist settler in the West Bank? Absolutely not. The, the effect it's telling us, Christ is telling us. So we have to be careful that we're not deceived in what they're telling us. And I believe that the words of Christ are a warning to us here to be careful of what we believe and what we hear because there's unclean teachings that are going to go into the world and bring nations um, to, to the battle of Armageddon. When we were in Shiloh, um, my, my wife and I, we uh, met this uh, man there called David Rubin, who is a very fascinating uh, uh, writer and, uh, and has done a lot in the community of Shiloh today. He, um, he started this uh, Shiloh Israel Children's Fund and a therapy center. And, I, and I'll explain to you uh, why this is and uh, what, he, uh, what he does. So during the Intifada, during the uprising, when there was a lot of violence um, in that area, he was driving with his son in the car um, uh, to Jerusalem, either 
from Shiloh to Jerusalem or from Jerusalem to Shiloh. He was driving along that road and his car was ambushed by terrorists and he, and, and, uh, he was shot. He was shot in the leg. His son was shot in the head. And, um, and as a result of that, he is why he started this therapy center for children who have been affected by terrorism and, uh, and it's in Shiloh. And we had a, he gave us a tour of the whole, of the whole center. Um, and it's, uh, it will make you cry to even think that there's children that need this therapy because of, uh, of terrorism. Here's his three-year-old son on that day when he was, when he was shot. And uh, here's a, uh, this is the music center, at the therapy center. And it's interesting, on the wall, uh, it has Psalm 150. Um, Praise the Lord with the, sh with the sound of the shofar and so forth. So those verses on the wall of the music center. And you can see the kind of biblical instruments over on the right-hand side. So uh, David Rubin would be what's considered a uh, religious Zionist. And uh, he gave us, he talked to us a little bit um, in the uh, synagogue there, which is shaped like the, uh, the tabernacle. They made it shaped like the tabernacle. So let's listen to, uh, to what he has to say. I'm standing here with you in Shiloh, which many people in North America know as Shiloh. This is the biblical heartland. This is where the, the tabernacle stood, where the capital of Israel was for 369 years, where a woman named Hannah prayed for a son, where Samuel the prophet was born from those prayers. He grew up into prophecy in Shiloh, and he was the one who would appoint the first two kings of Israel. Saul and David. We're going through a similar process in these times. It says in the book of Genesis, chapter 49, verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a scholar from among his descendants, until Shiloh comes. And his will be an assemblage of nations. Now why does it say until Shiloh comes? Well, the biblical commentators teach us that Shiloh means Messiah. That the process of the redemption of Israel runs through Shiloh, through the biblical heartland of Israel, and only then does it get to Jerusalem. And in these difficult times, in particular, when we in our communities here in the biblical heartland have suffered from the terrorism to a great extent, that's when we need to be banding together. Now, I spoke about the terrorism. Well, if you walk in our neighborhood here, you will see terror victim family after terror victim family, families that have lost children in terrorist attacks, families in which parents have been killed or wounded in terrorist attacks. In fact, my three-year-old son and I were both wounded in a terrorist attack some years back when terrorists ambushed our car. Uh, my, I was shot in the leg, my son was shot in the head, and we miraculously survived that attack. We came out of that attack with a mission. And the mission, which frankly it took me a while to figure out the mission after I finished counting the miracles, uh, that God blessed us with on that day. Uh, but the mission that we came out of it eventually came to be called the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund, whose purpose is to heal the trauma of the terror victim children, and yes, to rebuild the biblical heartland of Israel through those children. So we've established therapy programs, educational programs for those children, and this has all led to another mission that I have which is to speak about what is really happening here in the biblical heartland of Israel, which is very different than anything that you're going to hear in the, new, the mainstream media. Uh, so I, I've written four books. So a very, very interesting man. Again, you can hear, you know, why does he live here? You can hear those ideas coming out as he speaks. Um, we also were able to visit this place called Amona. You may have heard about it on the news. Um, it was very uh, controversial. These homes had been built. The government at the time of Ehud Olmert, the government said these homes have to be uh, destroyed because there was a, a, a claim, uh, the Palestinians claimed it as it was their land. 
Um, a lot of these uh, organizations that, uh, that uh, would make these claims are funded actually by, by Europe and by external sources outside of, the, of Israel. It's, it's, uh, it's crazy. But anyway, so these, uh, these homes were destroyed and there was a big protest uh, when we, we visited the homes were, had been destroyed. This is the foundation of those, of those homes. These clashes became very, um, very severe. The police brought in uh, horses and, and a lot of people were, were wounded and hurt. But uh, it was a clash between the two ideas of what the nation of Israel would be. And so on the one side you had the, the religious Zionist people and on the other side the, the police and that that came. And uh, things, things were quite, uh, quite bad. Um, you can notice that all the young guys have the woolly kind of keepers on. Um, and they, so they forcibly removed them out of these homes. And uh, this picture actually made, uh, I think it was, was one of the pictures of the year. Uh, but um, that picture shows you the spirit of these people and, and what they're willing to stand for because of the belief that they have. So the point of looking at all these things is to see that a people is being shaped, a people is being formed, a different heart is being formed in those people by all these events and by, by the terrorism. And so uh, that stony, unteachable heart is being replaced by not, no longer a heart of adamant stone, but a heart that could understand, a heart that could perceive, that could accept um, the teaching that God is going to bring to those people. When it talks about the new covenant in, in Jeremiah, it talks about how the law is written in their hearts. So that's what God is preparing the heart of the nation so that they will have a new heart and a new spirit within them. And God will take away the stony heart out, out of them and, and give them a heart that is soft and malleable and, and teachable. So that is the stage I believe that we are in now. We're going to look uh, a little bit more about that in our, in our final class together. Uh, I see we're running out of time, so I'm just going to skip through this. Um, but uh, this is uh, the uh, divide today between religious and non-religious in Israel. I was just talking about this with some on the break, that how we define religion in, in our society is very different than how it's defined in Israel. When If I said I go to church a couple times a year and I've been baptized, you know, I would be counted as religious in, in, in this country or in Canada. But in, uh, in Israel, religion isn't based on whether you believe in God or whether you believe in the fulfillment of prophecy or something like that. Religion is based on do you keep Shabbat? Do you keep kosher? Do you fast on Yom Kippur on the Day of Atonement? Like this is how many rules do you keep? That's how religious you are. So you have to remember that because uh, a secular Jew may believe in God and many do, but they don't keep the commandments, so therefore they're counted as, as secular. Um, but even then you can see that Israel is becoming quite religious, and the growth of, relig of the religious community is so much greater because they have so many more um, children than the others. Um, we are, I'm going to go through this, all of it, but is there a God? 63% believe completely yes, 24% are not sure, and only 13% do not believe in God in Israel. On this, on this survey, and you can uh, go through th uh, the coming of Messiah, 39% completely believe, 29% not sure, and 32% do not believe in the coming of Messiah. So uh, quite interesting. Um, we, I think I'm going I'm to finish here. There's a couple more video clips uh, that uh, we could watch, but uh, maybe we'll either leave them out or open them to the next class. So uh, we'll just leave it at that for now, and, uh, and hand it back to our presider. Did you need the mic?